Well, good morning. And welcome to worship at St. Andrew's on this Labor Day Sunday. Uh, this is the last Sunday of our summer series, and it's the last uh, Sunday that we will be worshiping with our friends from Trinity. I want to uh, offer my thanks to them for uh, participating in our service through uh, scripture readings each Sunday. It's been delightful to uh, to have their input, and uh, last week to actually have uh, one a, a reader come in person. Rod Carley did that, so it was quite wonderful. Um, we're welcoming this morning the Reverend Rick Thorne to the pulpit. Thank you, Rick um, and Judy. Thank you for being here. Longtime friends of St. Andrews, we're so grateful that you could be here today to lead us in worship. Uh, welcome to Ralph. Uh, managed to stay cold free for another week. Thank you. Uh, to Bethany, who is filling in for Kim Della Rose Bell, who is uh, on a well deserved camping vacation, but still did the PowerPoint so that we could run it here. So uh, I hope they are refreshed in their camping experience. And the COVID choir. Thank you uh, to Faithful Derek and uh, to. Uh, to, to Karen Gooch, uh, and Derek, of course, running video and looking after the YouTube uh, upload later in the service. So thank you to all of you, and thank you for being here. Um, still stage three, still protocols, still masks, still social distancing, so and thank you for all of that. Thank you for calling ahead and reserving your seat. We're very grateful that you're doing that for us. And if you would, again, stay in your pew until an usher lets you know that it's uh, safe to exit socially distanced, that would be terrific. Thank you. We emptied the church from the back to the front, so that's very helpful. Um, I would like to uh, invite all of you uh, and uh, those who are watching um, to a wonderful celebration this coming Saturday, September 11, at 2 in the afternoon, uh, when St. Andrews, as an affirming church, will fly a progressive pride flag out in front of the church. Um, it's a statement of our support and love for all. So please join us for that. <clears throat> I'm going to call on Peter Haddo to uh, offer our acknowledgement and light our candle this morning. Peter. Good morning. As we gather for worship this morning, I would like to acknowledge that long before we arrived on these shores, others called this place home. For hundreds of years, the Indigenous people of Turtle Island worked with the spirits, water, fire, air, earth, the drum prayers, and songs of harmony. They walked the earth in harmony and respect for the universe and creation. We are in the Robinson Huron Treaty territory, and the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg people, specifically the Nipissing First Nation. We are grateful for their stewardship of this precious land. Today I am lighting the Christ candle to this flame to remind us that Christ is with us and Christ calls us to do his work here and outside the church. Thank you, Peter. Will you join me in the call to worship as printed in the order of service? God calls us from our work in the world. God has work for us to do. God calls us to feed the hungry. God has work for us to do. God calls us to seek justice and love kindness. God has work for us to do. God calls us to love one another. God has work for us to do. 
Our opening hymn is found in Voices United 517, Praise God for the Harvest. Join me in our prayer for the day and the Lord's Prayer. Loving God, on this weekend, when we recognize the value of work and the importance of respite from it, open our eyes to the inequities of labor across your world. Open our hearts to your purpose for us and be present as we offer ourselves and our gifts to your work. This we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Trusting in God's forgiving, welcoming love, let us approach God with a general prayer of need, knowing that our personal confessions are heard as well. Usually we see work as our job, if we have one, or our primary role with others, as though we only have one of those. We rarely think of the things we do as being done for you, and then we prove ourselves to be unworthy of your love. 
Forgive us for buying into what our society calls work so much that we determine our worth, burn ourselves out, and even define who we are by positions we get paid for. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Christ we are a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Thanks be to God for God's merciful handiwork. Well, we don't have a lot of kids here today. Oh, you may be kid in heart. But um, we certainly need to be thinking of children right now, particularly as we anticipate September, uh, the busyness of life, the beginning of school, uh, the, the increase in um, risky kinds of activities and such. So um, I'd like to just offer a prayer right now for the children. And uh, if you have your own personal thoughts and concerns for children, lift those up to God as well. That, that we may keep them in our minds and hearts. Let us pray. Lord God, we praise you for our children. Not just our own personal uh, nuclear family kids and uh, related relatives, but for all children. For they are precious to us as well as to you. We thank you for them. Right now, God, we ask that you would particularly hold them in your heart and in your care as they go forward into a new school year, uh, recognizing that so much of what's been going on with this pandemic has uh, uh, messed up their social life, has uh, uh, caused them to have to change and um, uh, be um, fretful about uh, different kinds of behavior for health's sake. And, uh, it just uh, meant really different and fluctuating methods of learning. And so um, we pray, God, that you'd particularly help kids with the stress of that and uh, with um, the challenge of change. Uh, we pray that they could continue to get the education they need and uh, not be held back by what's been going on. And we also pray that... Uh, You'd help them to, to sustain in healthy ways of living and perhaps even um, learn and in, encourage themselves and their own families and among their friends new and better ways of being so that uh, they can be healthy and strong for the future. Uh, God, uh, we also pray that you would lead, lead kids back to church too so that, that um, we can have them be the vital part of our faith community that they always are. And thank you for hearing all our concerns for them. In Jesus' name, amen. A reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 146. Alleluia! Praise Yahweh, my soul. I will praise you all my life. I will sing praise to my God while I live. Do not trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no salvation. When their spirits depart, they return to the earth, and on that day their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Israel, whose hope is in Yahweh their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in it. Yahweh, you keep faith forever. You secure justice for the oppressed. You give food to the hungry. You set captives free. You give sight to the blind. You raise up those who were bowed down. You love those who do justice. You protect strangers. You sustain orphans and the bereaved. But you thwart the way of the corrupt. Yahweh will reign forever your God, Zion, through all generations. Alleluia. May God bless to our understanding these words of Holy Scripture.
That was a cool reading, Darlene, really well done. This one is a gospel lesson from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 7. And I'm reading starting at verse 24 through to verse 37. From there, Jesus set out and went away uh, to the region of Tyre. He entered a house, and he did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile of a Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment to his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him inside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers in his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Hippaphtha, uh, and that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. These words are offered as wisdom for our journey. Well, on this Labor Day Sunday, as we reflect on work, what it means to us and others, I want to uh, draw your attention back to the gospel lesson for today. Um, I, I also want to reference that beautiful psalm, but uh, particularly the gospel lesson, because it's an extraordinary story. It really is. I mean, this is a story where Jesus changes his mind, basically redirects and revisions his whole ministry and all because of a foreigner, uh, a woman who in desperation uh, uses wit and, and desperation to get through to him, to touch his heart. Uh, so it's a, it's a very unique story. And um, we have to recognize that uh, in it, uh, Jesus... Uh, does one of the things that uh, one of my professors of uh, abnormal psychology used to call our greatest strength in terms of mental health. He adapts. He adapts to um, a different vision of work and a, a different world of need. Um, and, and I think uh, today as we reflect on work, um, more than ever we're called to um, use our power of adaptation to be prepared for and adjust to a brand new world in terms of uh, what we have to do in it and uh, in terms of how we have to serve God. So adaptation is one of the things I'm talking with you about today. Um, uh, the other thing that I, I want to reflect on um, harkens me back to uh, 1985, or middle of the 80s, when uh, in our society, we had 11% unemployment. And um, in, uh, I was in Sudbury area at the time, and uh, we were working on unemployment issues, job creation, and so on. And um, 
uh, as, as it happened, uh, the, the Pope for the Roman Catholic Church at that time was John the 23rd. And quite frankly and honestly, I didn't like a lot about what he was about in terms of policy, especially in terms of um, uh, his, uh, the policies that he was advocating f with regard to women and also with regard to LGBT to, uh, community. Uh, it, it was old fashioned right wing and, and oppressive. But one thing that John the 23rd said at that time that I was quite impressed with was what he said about labor, about work. And uh, it, it um, probably hearkened out of his struggle as a Polish man uh, in, where Poland at that time was struggling with labor issues with regard to uh, uh, the, the communist movement at the time. And, and what, what uh, John the 23rd said in a, a thing called an encyclical, was that um, everybody, everybody had the right to work. Now, I mean, you know, that might not seem so important to us today, but believe me, uh, when 11% of Canadian population was out of work, that was really an important thing. And w when you think about it, if, if everyone has the right to work, it's coming from somebody who's basing that on what he understands about faith and what God wants, then what it's saying is that God gives us work. And that uh, that whole way of thinking really changes how we view what work is. I mean, if God gives us work, then um, we need to be open to what God is giving us in terms of opportunity to do things uh, for the sake of the world, for the sake of God's agenda, for the sake of, uh, of the human purpose or the creation purpose. Um, God gives us the work we do. And I think that that very much affected how Jesus saw what he did. Um, his first, first sort of vision of of his um, job agenda, if you could say, uh, came from um, way back in the story of where after he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And you, if you recall, he was tempted there and, and he affirmed God's love for him. And then he went back into the church, was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And the passage was Isaiah 61, which... Uh, if you ever uh, get a chance to read that, it's worth it. It's that one where it goes, um, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, uh, to, to, to announce release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to, to announce um, uh, the good news of God. So, Th those, that particular passage became Jesus' work agenda. That's what he was about. But you see, um, as a, a Jewish child, and as a person who grew up with the ability to be a rabbi to the people of Israel, he basically saw himself as serving the people of Israel. When this woman came to him, one day and said, uh, uh, well, you know, um, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall off the table of the children. Uh, he, uh, he was challenged to see that his work was far broader, far greater than he had ever really imagined or figured for himself. It wasn't just about being Messiah to Israel. It was about uh, being a savior to the world. And uh, and he had an agenda now to, to serve everyone. Whosoever will may come. So uh, um, it, she, she kind of uh, blew his concept of his agenda out of the water and made it a brand new one. Um, and uh, all because of um, uh, the need of her daughter. And uh, as any mom knows, uh, uh, necessity is the mother of desperation. You, you do what you gotta uh, to, to get your kids' needs met. So, um, adaptation 
uh, is a, a, a mental health life skill we have. But openness to what God gives us in terms of work is really essential to see how broad our, our area of responsibility is. It's not just about a job. It's about a vocation. It's about a, 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 a need to kind of have a picture of what God wants and to look for opportunities to do that. You know, um, um, I have to, I can't help talking about COVID uh, today um, because it's everywhere around us, it's in our brains all the time, but uh, it's because I think uh, we're at a phase in this where we're starting to reflect on the, uh, the impact on us in terms of uh, our life as, as, a, as human beings. And one of the things that, that I'm sure you've been aware of is that as a result of COVID, a whole lot of people have been faced with uh, choice. And the, the choice is about how you care for not just yourself and your own health, but the health of uh, your neighbor, and particularly the health of um, vulnerable people around you. Not just your own loved ones, but also the vulnerability of seniors and people with uh, chronic illness and uh, children. And, and the, what's come out of this so far is that um, we really have a big choice on our hands about whether or not we're going to make health choices about vaccinating ourselves, about wearing masks, about social distance and so on. Um, because we care about the people around us and not just ourselves. And we make sort of uncomfortable choices or sacrifices because uh, they, they need that uh, to be well, not just us. And um, actually, when you think about how COVID's been going down, it's, it's amazing how many people have cared about their neighbors and, and adjusted their behaviors accordingly. For all the naysayers and critics and press they get, the fact is that a whole lot of adolescents and young adults have cared way earlier than I ever did when I was one because, because they know uh, that grandma, grandpa, or whoever is uh, vulnerable. And so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's, it's been a kind of crossroads with regard to that. Uh, the second thing is uh, we've really reassessed the worth, worth of essential services and people, haven't we? I mean, like, you know, um, the very term of essential workers has become to the fore, and a whole lot of people that didn't get recognition sort of got it for a little while at least, maybe more. I mean, you know, uh, people uh, who are on the front line not only of health services, and making amazing sacrifices at risk, but also people who do things like um, food production and uh, distribution, right, delivery services, um, uh, you know, uh, people who are doing emergency services. Uh, we've really been reflecting on a whole lot of essential services that we found we can't do without in the crunch. Um, and that begs the issue of uh, how we see work what's important work, you know, how we remunerate uh, people, how we resource people, how, how we provide for their sick time and so on so that uh, they can get it done. I, I mean, if we were to carry that concept forward and not just run back to the old ways, that changes the nature of what's important in terms of work, doesn't it? Uh, you know, uh, th that's something that's been going on and we need to be conscious of. Uh, we can, I can also identify how uh, we've increased the value of home life. Like, um, life at home has become a whole lot more important because we're, we've been sort of stuck there. And we've had to face one another. Uh, and, and, you know, um, when I, I worked uh, with employment issues in Sudbury uh, for a while and did counseling, it, it was always um, challenging when um, guys were laid off. Usually the men were laid off and they didn't know what to do and they were stuck at home and it caused a crisis in the home because now they were in the, their wife's face and, and uh, they had uh, all, all this turbulence as they tried to find space for one another. But we've been going through that lately with COVID as families are more 
at, at home and for workplace, kids at homeschooling, you know, um, it's, it's changed the life of, of family life. And uh, we have to, I think uh, we've had to make choices and say, well, how can we make this qualitative? You know, how can we do uh, uh, more wholesome things at home? And we've been trying and experimenting and doing that stuff. Or uh, likewise, uh, the need to get out. And I was talking with Lois this morning about that, the, the need to um, uh, get fresh air, you know, and get, get beyond the cabin fever. And so we've been doing lots of more biking and walking and, and outdoor activity uh, directly because of this crisis. And so we, I think if, if, if we hold on to some of that, it changes how we value home life and it changes how we value outdoor life. Uh, home, there's a lot more, the, the home, price of homes has been going up uh, because people are putting more into their homes. Uh, there's shortages of wood because more people have not only been not manufacturing it, but also they've been using it up. Uh, it, those things have changed in terms of their worth to us, and therefore it affects our work. There, therefore, uh, we are getting uh, new priorities in terms of uh, hopefully how we spend our time and how we employ people. I, I mean, maybe we need to prioritize the service of people and those kinds of jobs over uh, the making of widgets, over the production of things. I mean, maybe we're, sh we're going to be shifting to where more people do the, the jobs for people and more machines to do the making of the widgets. Because I think, I hope, uh, people are shifting how they spend uh, away from the accumulation of widgets, you know what I mean, stuff, material, to, uh, uh, to the care of one another. And those are the jobs that we really need human beings to do, don't we? And where, where we really need um, the uh, 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 strengths and the training and, and the care. Um, uh, and um, uh, so uh, I think that that represents a change for us, for us if we follow through on that. Uh, why shouldn't more people just to pick up on, on the, the story of the gospel again about the woman uh, and her wisdom, why shouldn't more people from outside our comfortable circle influence our agenda? I mean, I can think of uh, one Hindu woman in this particular community who's had a powerful influence on a group of Christian leaders about the work that needs to be done to combat racism. Really has. Uh, and uh, the, what's mattered is uh, the truth that she brings. And it, uh, I, th I think it was just like the gospel lesson for today. If we are open like Jesus to belief that God gives us work that we have to do, then we better be ready to hear the needs of all kinds of people. And we better be ready to let our heartstrings get pulled again by surprise encounters with a whole new world of needy people. That woman touched Jesus' heart, and, and he had the, the grace within himself to change, to meet uh, the needs that God was giving him. I, I hope that our hearts are vulnerable in the same kind of way, so that we can make the changes that we need uh, to be ready for God's world of the future. Let us pray. Lord, who knows what the world's going to look like coming out of COVID? Only you do. Uh, but we just ask that you'd help us be ready in terms of what you're trying to show us through it. Uh, it's not that all things work together for good, but that you work for good through all things. And you, you are changing us and the world around us so that it's less materialistic and more uh, uh, what people need uh, so that um, they won't be marginalized or they, they won't be uh, neglected 
are the won't be uh, victims uh, of uh, the bullying of others. So God, empower us to uh, adapt our agenda so the work we see is work for you and that it's effective for the new world ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. So our hymn uh, to follow up is number uh, 171 in More Voices, Christ has no body now but yours. Let us pray. Creator God, the one who gives us strength to work, minds to envision, and hearts to persevere, we thank you for calling us to do your work. We remember in grateful prayer today all those who work diligently in our restaurants, in agriculture, in childcare, in our retail industry. These are just some of the people who live paycheck to paycheck. We pray that laws will change so someday they will earn an income sufficient to pay for the basic necessities of life, so they can live with dignity and participate as active citizens in our society. 
May the work of their hands provide the means they need to care for themselves and their families. Thank you for those that provide so many necessary services that keep our lives and our country working like clockwork. Help us to treat them as we would want it to be treated. Let us never overlook them or underestimate their value. Jesus, who labored as a carpenter and continued to work with those less fortunate, the homeless, the sick, and the outcast, help us do your work in our church, our community, and in the world. May we be examples of faithfulness in every task, no matter the size to which we put our hands to doing. Loving God, we pray for those who are sick at home or in the hospital. May they find comfort in your love. We pray for those who are furthering their education. Keep them safe. Open their ears eyes and hearts to the needs of others so they can grow to be more attentive, sympathetic, and understanding. God, open our mouths that we may speak words of truth and reconciliation. Transform our words into actions so the voices of residential school survivors and those voices taken or silenced will be heard. May all we do reflect your love. Amen. Uh, let us recognize that as we present to God our morning offering, it's a token of um, all we present to God in terms of our living and what we do in work, uh, and what we do in, uh, in care, and being who we are before God. You can say this in unison with me if you'd like. It's, it's just a little quote from a, a hymn in Voices United, and uh, it's a good dedication as we present these gifts to God. Your work, O God, needs many hands to help you everywhere. And some there are who cannot serve unless our gifts we share. Amen. And our closing hymn is, is called Take My Gifts and Let Me Love You.
I gotta say, I spend a lot of years uh, picking hymns to go with the church service, you know, and when I come here, I just say, well, uh, how about we let Ralph do it? <laughs> and it, tur it turns out I, I pick up a whole bunch of new hymns that I never sang in all those years, and that, these are really good today, thanks. Well, we have a name, Christ's name, and we have a task, Christ's task. So go into the world with a daring and tender love and know that the spirit of Jesus is in you to do, do God's will. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and remain with us always. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Please join us again next week as Reverend Lillian Roberts returns to our pulpit. Have a blessed week. Mm -hmm.